So hi, everyone. If you're here, you're seeing these slides. You're probably here to learn about how to achieve proactive security and compliance in your software development life cycles. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit about how to deliver fast and improve security posture in a highly regulated industry, um, how to make proactive security decisions around risk and third party code, um, how to leverage some new tools and automations to help developers optimize cloud native application security. And uh, from Samir's perspective, learn a bit about how to make a case for a business case for developer security operations within your own organization and teams. So I'll let Samir introduce himself here. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Lauren. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I am Samir. I am head of engineering for Equity Knowledge Partners. Um, Equity is a, is, a, is a leading research and analytics firm. We have been in the business for almost 20 years now. Um, and by the nature of our business, you know, we, we work with uh, financial services companies. Um, so therefore, you know, this is a this is a very strong case for, you know, for for why we take security very seriously, uh, not just in um, the way we we do business, but also the way we have been designing and building applications. Uh, as head of engineering, I am responsible for uh, most of the security and development best practices that we have brought into the organization. And I will be, you know, I will love to speak uh, about some of those with, with all of you today. And um, I'm your moderator today, Lauren Place. I am the product man marketing manager specific for Sneak IAC. So sort of the voice of the product externally and specifically focused around securing your Terraform co code and configurations. Um, so before we hop into the topic, I'd like just Samir for you to talk a little bit more about the technologies in your stack and what sort of challenges you're first facing and in, in your journey. Um, absolutely. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> I, um, so talking about the technology stack, so we, we have been mostly, you know, a Microsoft shop for a few years. Um, we have been working with different versions of .NET framework in the past, but for the last several years, I think after the advent of .NET Core, which is the you know, uh, platform independent cross-platform version of .NET that came out, we have been using it uh, quite a bit. Uh, so that is the primary backend uh, framework that we work with. On the front end, uh, since everything that we're building is mostly you know, web-based, uh, you know, a service or, a, or an application, we are working with either React, JS, or Angular. Um, you know, as our single page application frameworks. Um, and in terms of the databases, again, you know, there is a there is a variety that we use. So SQL Server, MongoDB in many cases, and then, you know, some of the cloud natives ones like uh, Amazon Aurora and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, mostly it's, it's Microsoft heavy um, mm -hmm. stack that we are generally working with. Okay, so Microsoft heavy, um, you also I understand are using uh, Terraform for your infrastructures code and um, containers as well. Yeah, so uh, when, when we, uh, if we talk about the infrastructure that hosts mm -hmm. everything that we've been building you know, for all these years, um, we, we, we are deploying them mostly as containers today. Um, and um, the and then we are deploying all, all in cloud, so there is there is basically no on-prem deployment for the technology that we have been building. Um, so we are fully hosted into AWS, um, and the way we set up our infrastructure is uh, we have brought in infrastructure as code automation using Terraform. Um, so everything essentially gets deployed using the code. Um, so there is very little manual intervention in terms of you know setting up, creating environments. Um, and then you know deploying applications on those. So, yeah. so Terraform is a big piece of uh, our, our um, infrastructure management. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, so it's good to hear a bit about the technologies in your stack. I'd love to hear next. Uh, starting in on this question about the journey, um, what got you thinking about making changes in 
how you handle handle security operations and integrate sort of DevOps with security at Acuity? Uh, okay, so um, I would you know like to take a minute to you know uh, talk to you about the journey um, at Acuity, right, with respect to technology. So as I mentioned that we have been in the business, we have been in the market for close to 20 years now. Um, and technology was always you know, something which was, uh, for at least 10 years, uh, technology has been um, you know, an important piece of the puzzle of uh, how we take our services to the customer. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, for up until 2016, early 2017 also, um, the setup that we had in technology was not very formalized, right? So we were, we were, we were building technology, but it was being mostly done in isolation, right? So one team here and there, or any other team somewhere else, they were building something, but it was, you know, within silos, within isolation. So because of that, everybody was essentially following their own set of practices, their own set of, you know, ways and means of doing things. There was also a diversity in terms of the technology stack that we were using and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest um, factor that was kind of resulting into these silos was that we were not deploying into cloud, we were deploying on-prem. So mm -hmm. there were a number of servers that our IT used to be managing, you know, maintaining for us to enable these technologies to be given to the customer. Uh, but when uh, in 2017, essentially, we took a leap, leap of faith, right, and then decided to make or take technology mainstream. Uh, when we say that, uh, it means that we started to think about how technology is going to be the, uh, you know, the, the edge for us. Uh, you know, in, in, when we look at ourselves, our services, and compare those to the competition. So we decided that you know technology is going to be the the the, the leverage that we would like to enhance, you know, uh, take benefit of. And when we do, when we did that, we very thoughtfully decided to you know do the right things. Uh, so we did not wanted to move into identifying you know things that we were supposed to build, uh, and then you know think about how do we take them to market. We started to devise a plan. You know, how do we remain in compliance? Uh, with the you know very regulated industries that we work in, which is financial services, um, with respect to the software and the technology that we will start building and we will start offering our customers. Um, and, and since you know everything was revolving around things to be built that were used to, that were to be used by our customers, there was there was very little room for us to really make any mistake, right? So the traditional DevOps process where you build something and then you you know get it into um, the security hands, let them scan yeah, it, find yeah, out okay. issues that you fix. That reactive approach was not something we were comfortable you know going with. So we we started to think about the entire pipeline, uh, and then we essentially found that there are obvious gaps uh, both in skills. Uh, processes um, and then you know how do we how do we stitch them together right so so we took uh, some time to figure that out uh, and we started with uh, you know the, the the secure SDLC as the process from the word go that we wanted to really follow from day one of of when we start to build these products um, and then that's when we started to look at you know who is doing what uh, what are the different teams that are going to be involved. How do we bring them together and make them agree to a, a you know a process implementation, which is going to guide us through the you know rest of the journey that we were taking the plan then. Um, so yeah, so that's how we basically started. And I think when we reflect back today with 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 fifty thousand plus users to, on our applications, we feel pretty good about you know that decision uh, because we were not we we are not really we never find ourselves in a situation where we are regretting a decision, whether it was architectural or infrastructure related, and then trying to solve it. Uh, we essentially have very clear view on uh, what could go wrong, so we should not do this, right? Um, and then essentially developing things right from the first go. Um, so we, so yeah, this time that we spent initially in 2017 in figuring out things has been pretty useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds excellent. You were thinking much more preactively, and so you no longer have that putting out the fire 
um, sort of mindset when it comes to exactly. uh, yeah. fixing vulnerabilities. Mm. Um, and, and so this sounds like a massive undertaking, like you were both thinking about a cloud migration project and also uh, smartly so thinking about how you could embed security throughout the the process, um, the sort of like modern way of thinking about cloud application security. But how did you get everyone else on board with your transition to this more um, formalized DevSecOps approach to security? Was there, um, you know, a learning curve there? Uh, there certainly was, uh, because this, as I mentioned, right, this, this identity was a leap of faith. Um, so um, there were, there were, there were gaps in our understanding of uh, you know how different tools work uh, you know if essentially what are what are the tools available you know uh, at our disposal really uh, that can help us to streamline the process reduce friction um, help us create a process where everybody knows you know whose responsibility is what um, and then not to land into a situation where security is somebody else's problem right um, so we we did have uh, a steep learning curve certainly, um, but I think uh, what what's really great about equity is that uh, people are um, you know very open to learning new stuff, learning new things, um, and so when we when we put together a you know a blueprint of how we want to run this program together, we basically involved uh, the CTO, the you know who, who essentially is the head of enterprise IT. Um, and then which essentially is going to be taking care of both the on-prem setup, the clouds, you know, infra that we run on, uh, how does the on-prem communicate with the cloud and, you know, how do we ensure uh, the, the larger perimeter security of, of all the infrastructure. So that sits with the CTO. Then obviously the, from the compliance side, there was a CISO, the, the information security officer um, and his group. Um, so these folks usually are the ones who, who come when you have you know, an application ready to be deployed to, you know, to finalize and sign off on the last bit, right? So, uh, but we very clearly, you know, wanted to do this differently. We did not want to wait till the time developers have finished building something and then going to the CISO and then the information, information security uh, set up for certifications, right? Or for, for getting it through so that we can deploy. So we basically brought in, you know, all these different parties together. Uh, we told them, you know, shared our, our, our vision of how do we want to build this engineering function? Uh, what are what are the places, what are the areas or what are the workflows we think uh, are going to be requiring their involvement? Uh, and then, you know, with, with their assistance, we were able to put together uh, a GRC process, which uh, essentially is something which was, you know, then communicated to all the different stakeholders. People were made aware of uh, the different uh, requirements, different uh, stages of that process and where somebody has to get involved. Um, and then, you know, tools required for managing this workflow, et cetera, they were agreed upon. Um, it it took, us, took us a while. It's not that we did not start working, but uh, we did not take things to production before, you know, this, this setup was in, in place entirely. So with regards to the question that you posed, there was a steep learning curve, but I think um, the, the, uh, you know the the intentions, the 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 way everybody got together, uh, understood you know what we were trying to solve, uh, and committed themselves to it. I think that really made it uh, you know not so difficult to journey really for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it was a lot of effort applied, but for a pretty high payout. You know, you're able to bring the teams together and and break down some of those silos that you spoke of before to have a much more efficient, uh, painless process. Um, sure. Just one follow-up question. I'm, I'm wondering, you talked about bringing leadership together, creating a vision, developing up a, a process to make um, procurement and mutual understanding of what you were signing up for uh, throughout your teams. But uh, how was it on the sort of uh, developer adoption side of things, you know, communicating to the people that maybe would be taking on and using these tools in the day-to-day? -day? Right, so um, developers, uh, you know, so so one of the one of the things that we were specifically doing in equity was 
mm-hmm. that we were not really going out in the market and you know hunting for the talent uh, because we were trying to do something different that was never done. Uh, our approach was always that you know we will be helping the existing teams scale up, right? Scale up, uh, understand, pick up the pick up the skills that they are not comfortable with, and then um, you know take them along in in the journey, right? Uh, but but we never wanted to really go out, import somebody in uh, who will bring a different mindset, a different culture, and then try to you know impose things things onto us. So I think that was one of the decisions that has helped us to you know bring the developers together on, on this journey. Now, uh, having been been a developer myself for seventeen years, uh, you know the the usual mindset has been that um, as a developer, I am responsible for building stuff. Uh, right, uh, security is, is something which which comes last, right? So if I find something in a VAPT, right, I I will fix it. But I I want to really focus on building the functionality. So that mindset is what we started to talk to developers early on. Um, we started to share, as I said, the vision uh, with all the stakeholders, including the developer, de- you know, developer staff. Uh, told them why this is important to be handled at you know, and why, in fact, the, the concept of shift left is what we started to, you know, talk to developers from, from the beginning of, of the program. We very specifically gave them use cases, help them understand why is it important? What is it that it will help us achieve? Uh, why is it important to test, uh, you know, before you writing, you know, start writing the first code? Uh, why is it important to ensure that the third party components that you're going to be using, they are the ones which are not having any known vulnerabilities and how can you, you know, validate and how can you test those. Um, and then that sharing of vision uh, that, you know, also imposing faith into the developers that you know, we trust that they will be able to uh, understand and pick up the process that is eventually going to be put in place, um, it helped us to, you know, really sail through that process. So um, it, it, it will be unfair to say that, you know, we were able to address this on day one. So that was not the case, but we were able to identify specifically actions that were supposed to be taken on our side. For example, you know, specific developer trainings, uh, resources to be given to the developers uh, using which they can, you know, speed up uh, this, this particular learning curve. Um, and, and then, you know, still giving them time so that, you know, they, they they can make mistakes and you know they will be able to correct it as as we were moving along the journey. I think that has uh, helped us to you know buy, get the buy-in from the developers particularly and and I think which was the most important uh, buy-in you know to be able to bring about the adoption to the secure SDLC that we have here at Activity. Mm-hmm. Was that they they could it was really about mitigating that risk early and that developers could make mistakes, but um, they would have the resources to them to be able to apply, learn, understand, and apply their own fixes in the process. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. yeah. And I think one of the important uh, benefits that we have kind of reaped from uh, cloud adoption is that uh, we can afford to make mistakes uh, because, you know, with the help of tools like IAC and, and Terraform, um, it's it's really very easy for us to you know put something together up, uh, deploy application, see if you know we we run into any problems, uh, and if if we if we did, you know on on a click of a button we can terminate the instances, terminate the infrastructure, and create it back again, right? Without having to you know um, get involved into delays. Uh, days versus you know days will be smaller compared to the you know weeks and months that it used to take. Uh, you know, when, when setting up the Yeah, you can deploy uh, much faster, but you have to have just the same amount of security in those processes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you gave me a kind of perfect segue there, uh, mentioning your how IAC and Terraform uh, played into the change with your migration to the cloud and your DevOps processes. Uh, we have a question for the audience here. Uh, Sarah's going to flip the slide. Um, just a quick poll here. You can answer uh, one, two, three, four in the chat. Uh, are you implementing infrastructure as code uh, at your organization or within your teams today?
Let's see about 56% of our audience has answered. Oh, it's going up. I'll, I'll let for a couple more people answer the poll. Right, so it looks like we have the right crowd here today. Roughly half of you are implementing ISC today um, and about 20% planning to in the next, the next year. Okay, going to close the poll now. And our next audience question here is around IAC security. So how or when do you handle IAC security today? Is it, is it catching misconfigurations in deployment like Samir was talking about, or is it configurations during development? the newer process that Samir was talking about. There's also the painful process of manual security reviews um, or just not dressed today. And it's, it's something you're interested in learning more about. Okay, so Results are looking like a mix of things. So all sorts of different uh, variations for how IAC security is handled. And it's, it's a relatively uh, new concept. So I feel like everyone's sort of figuring out what is best practice or looking into new options for um, how to secure their configs. Okay, with that, we're going to wrap up the polling for a bit and talk about one team security as a shared responsibility. Um, so Samir, another question for you. Uh, what's the best way, I guess, to, to shift left to get others involved and integrated in security without creating friction between all these different teams, the security operations and developer operations and the actual application developers themselves? Uh, yeah, great question. Thank you, Laura. Um, see, in my experience where I have been part of teams where uh, um, security was always considered to be, you know, somebody else's problem, um, mm -hmm. usually because the way organizations have been set up, um, generally, you know, the, the departments that are made responsible for ensuring the security posture of the of the organization are the ones that are really not uh, into building applications right they they they, they sit as silos generally um and then only you know are, are the ones that are going to be sending across policies and documents your way generally um we were not you know we, we were not any different frankly speaking uh we were in, in the same boat really um but you know, we were we were very uh, sure from day one that um, if we have to deliver stuff faster into production without making our customers wait, um, you know, for either a feature or a patch or a fix, uh, you know, when when things are in production, we cannot afford uh, to keep you know the responsibility to be with a different team and out of the developer groups. Um, so the fundamental principle that we started to you know think about, talk about um, with different stakeholders, including the developer teams, the uh, information security functions, the enterprise IT functions, uh, and even the executive, uh, we we started to talk to them about security being a shared responsibility. So when we said that, we say you know the first line of code that we will ever write, uh, whether to make sure that that is not going to cause any security vulnerability, either to the application or to the infrastructure that it will be hosted on, um, has to be you know, something which the developers will have to start owning. 
Um, having said that, uh, we also started to talk about that the responsibility and the ownership of information security functions will only not be limited to you know giving us guidelines and directions. They have to come together and get involved into helping us identify flaws early on in the process, not when you know things were ready to be you know go live. Um, the way we started doing that was uh, we started to uh, implement programs like security champions. Now, when we say security champion, um, it's a fancy word. I, I see this doing rounds on internet all, all the time. But what we really started doing was that uh, since most of the developers will take some time to ramp up, understand, under, understand security and understand information security requirements and compliance requirements, um, we decided that, um, so, so the way we are structured our product development groups, these are teams of you know anywhere between seven to 10 people. Mm -hmm. um, the, the concept that Amazon follows, right? We can feed these groups by two large speakers, uh, not, not, not more than that. So these groups will have a group, you know, anywhere between four to five developers, uh, one or two testers, and then other roles. Um, so we brought security into the pods directly. Right? So we started to invite nominations for from developers who would like to become security champions for the board. Uh, with very specific, clear KRAs, you know, that they will have to own security posture of the application uh, during building, during writing the code, and before it goes to your production. Um, and then this, this particular role of the security champion was then the point of contact for information security groups mm -hmm. who can pass on requirements, right? Guidance, directions, um, policies, uh, you know that that we had to adhere to, so to say, uh, through this particular person into the into the product development groups directly. Um, so so with this, I think the biggest benefit that we got that there the the silo that was otherwise you know existing uh, between the information security and the developer groups immediately started to you know shorten. Um, any change in information security requirements, for example, at the org level. Were immediately transitioned into the pod by means of you know this uh, security champion, uh, and we have seen that over the time, over the several years that we have been doing this now, uh, these uh, champions have essentially started to own more than just that. For example, they will become point of contacts for external vendors, right? When when we get our applications pen tested uh, annually, so they are the ones that become bridge between the the, the pen tester uh, and the product group and the information security functions, uh, thereby you know being able to maintain one single golden source of truth in in terms of the findings and so on and so forth. So I think this is one aspect of you know how we were able to bring about the sense of security being a shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, because we were we were able to bridge. Uh, and take the developer teams to the information security teams uh, and bring the information security teams into the developer group by means of creating you know such bridges between between the two mm -hmm. security champions within each of the teams yep it's very smart um and so i think after we wrap up this topic we had one more audience question where does the responsibility lie? So who is responsible for securing your IAC? I just launched the poll here. And we'll give it a couple seconds for everyone to submit their answers. Okay, and it looks like the results are mixed, but definitely leaning towards 
the developer, uh, you know, SREs, infrastructure engineering teams, people that are, you know, maybe directly managing um, Terraform files and making changes in those configurations or people that just make slight modifications or are building their applications on top of IC. Okay, and this brings us to our final topic here today. It's the impacts. So proactively improving security and compliance at Acuity. Um, what was sort of the, the business value of implementing these changes with Sneak to Acuity? Um, right, so as you can imagine, when we, we work with, I think, the largest of the banks uh, you know, in the world, uh, who many of whom are, you know, are, are still not very comfortable with cloud, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that they, they will not be because they are getting there, but it's still, uh, you know, something which is supposed to be uh, not a bank's thing, right? So, um, the, and then since the decision that we made with respect to the technology that we were building to have it deployed into cloud, um, you know, and then have no, comp no negotiations on that front, um, we were, you know, we, we were to remain prepared for, uh, you know, the compliance and, and regulation related questions coming from, from our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, because essentially we are, we are going to be asking them to, you know, bring over their data into our systems and then not just on-prem, but, you know, on, on the cloud. Um, so um, the, the usual process remains that, you know, we are sent uh, multiple pages of due, you know, due diligence questionnaires. Yeah. around uh, the security posture, how do we manage data residency requirements, how do we ensure that the data and NNA procedures remain in compliance to GDPR, for example, right, in the context of Europe and, and so on and so forth. Um, so with, with, regards to, with regards to things like those, you know, we were able to very confidently answer um, and then convince the customers that uh, the infrastructure, the application, um, and the, the data flow process that we are implementing uh, is kind of foolproof, um, and you know there are um, there are auditability, there is um, observability built into this, uh, and then we can respond to any requirement uh, either today or in the future uh, that they may ever have to respond to their you know regulators with regards to anything. So bringing security uh, into the DevOps process, into the development process. And uh, you know, taking or bringing the different groups responsible for managing security together um, has actually helped us go out in the market and then you know uh, confidently tell our customers that um, the technology that we are building is it, not just only user friendly, but it is secure uh, to you know on every aspect um, of that that can that is you know that is ready to pass the test of regulations anytime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were able to improve not only your security posture, but the, the confidence that your customers had in you for just being so much more secure. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and was there sort of any impact you mentioned there that the, the processes got a little better, the security development team started to understand that security was a shared responsibility there. And the technology with Sneak was able to sort of correct a skills gap between, I know how to code, but I don't know how to, you know, fix my code in the security sense. Um, was there any sort of impact on developer productivity or feedback on that sort of process adoption of developers starting to handle a bit of security issues? Yes, um, so I think, um, so this, this was one of the one of the areas that we thought would be challenging. Of you know, how do you how do you continue to expect and gain the productivity that we wanted from the developers? Mm -hmm. Because we wanted to you know deliver fast. Uh, we wanted to be able to <clears throat> roll out features very frequently into the production. But how do we do that if the developers were to remain fixated on you know identifying security issues and uh, validating and fixing them before moving to anything else? Um, and then therefore, you know, uh, platforms uh, that were capable of doing this 
uh, we started looking for them and then very gladly you know we we, we finalized sneak uh, as, as our go-to platform for that um, so what what sneak has enabled us to do really is um, the different integrations possible right so sneak has a CLI um, option available sneak has apis um, sneak has plugins the developer environment plugins that we can you know use in add-ins um, so we we have actually brought in all of these integrations into the process. So, uh, for example, Visual Studio is our uh, primary developer environment. So, Sneak, uh, you know, interface Sneak plugin for uh, Visual Studio is available. So, uh, developers really don't have to do anything extra, right, to be able to uh, write better code uh, <laughs> because you know the Sneak is monitoring. Sneak is monitoring what we are writing, right? So, anytime we write something, there is a problem. It gets flagged. The sneak plugin will tell us. So uh, we were able to reduce, you know, the time that were that was otherwise supposed to be spent by the developers into identifying security, you know, problems by introducing tools like Sneak, and uh, therefore not having any significant impact on productivity. Um, and then people can actually go about doing their development work business as usual uh, because. In our case, uh, identifying security vulnerabilities or license compliance problems with regards to the third party components or open source uh, is really part of the process, right? We don't have to do anything extra to start addressing or start you know, looking at those aspects. And because of the tools like Sneak, I think uh, this is true for not just the you know, .NET code that we're writing, it is also true for uh, IAC, right? It is also true for the Terraform scripts that we have been creating, because uh, we are able to scan, you know, Terraform on the go. So while we are writing it, I think we, we get feedback uh, at the point uh, when we have integrated it into uh, execution environment. We get uh, feedback through the CLI, uh, and then there is the API option. So we were able to find, you know, these smart ways of, um, you know, making these integrations possible and, and work for us by not really having an impact on the developer productivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds excellent. So embedding it early, and so you don't even have to think about it, you know, in the IDEs, Visual Studio Code, uh, in your sort of CI pipelines, like in your Git repos with automatic rescanning of your Terraform and other configuration right. files. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the way we, we work with toolchain today is that Mm -hmm. uh, even when the developers are sleeping, uh, snack, Sneak is doing its work, right? So uh, when we log in for the first day, right, uh, next day, uh, we would see if anything has gone wrong or if there are new vulnerabilities that were reported as a Slack uh, message, right? So we have integrated Sneak, for example, in Slack, uh, which is the primary communication medium for all the developers. Um, so we, we don't even have to open the code base, really. Uh, we will know what to do you know, how to fix those uh, and then so on and so forth. So yeah, so I think these integrations that are available as part of the technology set that we're using have really made a made a big impact on, on the way we do uh, software development now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna ask you a sort of hard question here because we talked about, you know, how this was a journey and you put enormous amounts of effort in engaging all the different stakeholders and, um, communicating to developers with the security champions that uh, security would be a shared responsibility and help closing the skills gap between security knowledge and actually applying, finding and applying the fixes. Um, but given what you've learned in this whole in this whole journey of modernizing and formalizing your software development practices with security at Acuity, uh, what sort of top line advice would you have for other engineering leaders? Um, I, I think from my experience, the, the advice that I have is uh, don't don't leave security out of the out of the mix. Really, um, it, it 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 may sound to be daunting at, at the beginning, I guess, because you have to you know bring along different people uh, with with different priorities into the mix. But um, it is best addressed at the beginning rather than you know late in the process. Uh, because then once once your uh, you know manufacturing lines have started to deliver output, 
then it becomes really difficult to you know start addressing these problems so my i think the the one advice that i have is uh, do not leave um, security out of the sdlc that has to be um, you know affected from day one uh, and i think shift left um, is is the way to to move forward mm -hmm. right okay um, and now we're going to just thank you so much for everything you had to share, Samir. Uh, we're just going to open it up to questions from the audience. Okay. Um, well, it looks like no one is curious that we have, Samir has spoken so eloquently and so comprehensively that we are all prepared. <laughs> so uh, with that, we can just move on to the next slide, uh, giving you some useful resources. A couple of these are specific to IAC security, um, but we have a resource here on IAC security best practices. You can check out a written version of what Samir has talked with us about today in Acuity case study, um, written up nice that concisely summarizes the points of today, um, saying what Acuity was interested in securing with their cloud native application and exactly how they went about doing it, what successes they found. Um, and we also want to offer you guys some free stuff. So um, coming in with Sneak, you can sign up for a free account. We hook up to all your Git repos and test uh, up to, I think for IAC, up to 300 tests a week are free. Um, our IDE plugins are available for Visual Studio Code and JetBrains. Um, and we also have a service called Sneak Advisor that can scan your open source code and find uh, if there's any vulnerabilities in your packages. Um, so all that can be found on the Sneak site or in these resource slides here. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you to the Linux Foundation for being wonderful hosts. Um, anything else you'd like to add, Samir? No, it was a pleasure speaking with you and, and all the wonderful audience. Um, hopefully, the you know the, the content we talked about is is useful, um, and I would like to wish everybody the very best in their security journey. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you so much, Samir, and um, big thank you to everyone who attended and participated today. We hope to see you back at a future webinar, and you can look for this recording on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.